Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 53. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very special guest from the other side of Pennsylvania, Matt Scaletti. Matt, what's going on, man? What's up, my friend? Thanks for having me, Joe. I'm excited, man. Uh, you're so welcome. We, uh, we've we been talking for the past couple minutes before we hit record, and I could already tell this conversation is going to be incredible. So why don't we just start with an introduction? Uh, if people don't know who you are, Matt, how would you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm um, 38 years old. I grew up in a small town about 15 miles east of Pittsburgh, and I was a basketball player. I still love basketball. I played in grade school and in high school. And then when I graduated high school, went off to college, tried to walk on to University of Richmond, did not go so well. And I realized that will not be my career path. And I think at that point I got introduced, I introduced myself to the party scene at mm -hmm. Richmond and I enjoyed the four years I had at college, but I also picked up a bad habit of over consuming alcohol. And I think that started a, a tough journey for me for about 10 years that I could not get over. And I, I got addicted to alcohol. I was an alcoholic for about a decade. And I guess I have an extreme personality and we can dive into any of these subjects that you want, but I changed my addiction to alcohol for an addiction to healthy living and fitness in about 2011. And I've been blessed to have a fun fitness journey. So was on uh, American Ninja Warrior. I've done some uh, endurance races and just been very blessed to exchange a negative habit for a positive one over the last about 10. It's been over 10 years now. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So I don't know if a lot of people know this about me and I know you don't know this about me, but, uh, in college, I actually gave up alcohol. I think before it became a real big problem, but I noticed that, you know, I was never having one beer. It was either zero beers or it was 20 beers. And it's weird to say, but I've never had a legal drink. Uh, it's been almost 10 years for myself since I've touched alcohol. And I also realized that I have a very, guess you could call it addictive personality. And so exercise is that thing for me. And I guess a question I have for you off the bat, Matt, is do you think it is possible to be in the world of endurance sports, ultra marathons, kind of the extremes of fitness without an addictive personality? Oh man, this question, I swear we could talk about this for an hour and a half in itself. I, I, I just, because I'm fascinated by it because I think the answer is probably no. And I'm only answering that from my perspective, but it's almost like you have to have a little bit of craziness and obsession to want to run 50, 75, a hundred plus miles. And I think I have that. I'd like to think it's a healthy addiction, but it's funny because I just, I, I met somebody about six months ago and she nicest person. And I started telling her what I did. And this was somebody that didn't know me at all. And just the look on her face, when I started saying things like, I want to, I'm signed up for this hundred mile ultra marathon. And she kind of looked at me like, do I want to be associating myself with this crazy person? Like, I don't know if this is a good idea. So, uh, yeah, I think you have to have a little bit of addiction, if that's what we want to call it, or insanity to want to do this stuff. 
But I also think, and you could probably speak to this, it's it's only crazy until you get to these events and then you surround yourself with people that do it on a you know four times a year, however often, and then you're normal again because you're around people who do it. So I'm a big believer in the quote, you are the average of the people you surround yourself with. And I've started to surround myself with a lot of ultra endurance athletes mm -hmm. and I'm on the low end. Like they think I'm not even close to their level and I feel like they're crazy. So I'm trying to continue to level up, but yeah, I think, I think it's a great question. I, I don't know what you think, but I do think there's, there's a level of addictiveness or obsession that has to come with some of these ultra endurance events. Obsession might be a better word for it. And I do think you have to have a screw loose. And I don't think that's a bad thing, <laughs> right? Um, episode yeah. not episode 11 of this podcast with my, my buddy, Danny uh, Jimenez. He was talking in our episode about the world of endurance sport. And he has a brand called Go Crazy. And with the premise of, you know, if being normal, having a desk job, being overweight and unhappy with your life is the norm, well, yeah, I don't want to be normal. Um, and there's this amazing quote by Frederick Nietzsche. And he says, those who dance are considered insane by those who can't hear the music. And oh, right. I know. That's right? so good. And we're just dancing to music that not everybody else is listening to, but you're not alone and you're not crazy. You're just in a different world, listening to different music with different people. That is such a great quote. And I totally agree. And I, I mean, it's almost like I've had two lives too, because I look back and think it was crazy of me to spend 10 years getting drunk four five, six nights a week and watching reruns of sitcoms at night and doing nothing with my life. Like that felt, that feels crazy now looking back at that. And I just tell the story to try to inspire somebody that's going down that path to maybe turn it around before it's too late and something, uh, you know, really bad happens, which I was lucky that I survived the alcoholism. But yeah, I, I think, I think you're right. I love that quote about the dancing. Who is it? Frederick Nietzsche. Who is it? Yeah. I'm going to butcher that. I I've probably been saying his last name wrong forever, but Frederick Nietzsche, uh, if you type in that quote into Google, it'll come up for sure. But uh, that's a great one. And, you know, to go further down this path, I'll ask you the, the first question I ask everybody, which is uh, what's the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle. So a circumstance that you didn't necessarily get to choose for yourself. Oh, that's a really good question. The hardest thing I've had to handle. There's a couple of them that come to mind and I'll, I'll throw them at you. I like it. We're diving deep quick, man. This is good stuff. The first one, and there's two that come to mind. I'll just throw them out there. I had, a, I tore my Achilles in August of 2020 running way too many marathons in a row. And you're talking about obsession. I look back and I think about this. I ran 21 marathons in 21 days. So I was just, I was running, I was waking up at like three o'clock in the morning, running a marathon. And I was raising money for a cancer charity at the time, which is why I kept running. And looking back, it was, it was my own fault because I overran. I was feeling pain and not, not discomfort pain, injury pain. And I decided to keep running. So I look back at that and I realize it was my fault, but at the same time, it was the hardest thing that I had to overcome at the time because I started to fall in love with running. And like we've been talking about, I'm obsessive. I, when I love something, I go all in and that was taken away from me. And it was taken away from me for uh, over a year. It was like 15 months and I had a minor surgery in august of last year no september of last year so to have something taken away that i started to really fall in love with it really affected me and i look back on that and just i think i learned a lot because i i don't want to be somebody that needs to be running ultra marathons to be happy like there's going to come a point in time i'm 38 where i'm not going to be able to run 50 miles, a hundred miles. And when that time comes, I don't want to be sad and depressed about it. I want to find other things to challenge me and keep me going. So 
that was a very difficult thing that I had to overcome. And I, I just posted about this yesterday on Instagram. I'm just, I, it almost makes me appreciate being mm. healthy even more. So I, somebody just asked me this, uh, a friend of mine said, do you regret overrunning? And it's easy to say, yes, I wish I would not have torn my Achilles, but at the same time, every second that I've run since then with no pain, it feels like I'm floating. Like it feels like the greatest feeling ever because it's almost like I thought I was done for the rest of my life. So it almost makes me appreciate the health even more going through that difficult injury. So that was probably the toughest thing, especially fitness wise I've had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and we talked about this real briefly before we hopped on, I went through a divorce a little over a year ago. And of course I, I was half of the marriage. So I had something to do with that. It was just, it wasn't fully expected at the time. So this came shortly after the Achilles tear and it was just, and as you and I discussed previously, it's almost like when things go wrong, sometimes it can be two or three things at the same time. And I, similar to you, look at it and go, okay, I overcame alcoholism. I overcame a divorce. I overcame an Achilles tear that knocked me out for a year and a half. I can handle now a lot of what life throws at me day to day. So I think the setbacks only make us stronger. And I always look forward to the comeback because I think that's always more powerful than the setback. Mm. There's so much good stuff there. I think the thing that jumps out to me first and foremost is just the contrast between good and bad, hard and easy, bitter and sweet. And I think that adds a lot of richness to life. Like you described, you know, you have a whole new appreciation for running after you couldn't run for those 15 months. My question for you, I guess, would be in the beginning, right? When you tore the Achilles or you you had that initial injury, were you thinking that when that happened? And if so, great, that's amazing. And if not, how long did it take you to get to the point where you were like, yeah, maybe this is like, this is okay. It'll give me perspective. So I, I think it humbled me big time because I was not thinking that my crazy head was thinking, okay, my, I did, I did not know my Achilles was torn for months after it happened because I guess I'm a, a typical guy who has a big ego and thought I could just push through any pain, which was not the case. And I put off seeing somebody about it. I, I was icing it down. I was not running but I just thought I'm going to get over this in a month or two and then everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, three months turned into four, turned into five. And as each month progressed, my attitude towards it sort of got more defeating until I finally got the news uh, from an ortho, I guess it was, and said that you, you clearly have a problem here. Like this is, a, this is a significant injury. So at that point, I'm just somebody that, as soon as I got that news, I thought, okay, I'm not going to be all poopy pants, like put my head down and cry about it. I did it to myself. Like I need to take ownership of that. Hmm. What's the next step? How do I fix it? Can I fix it? What are we doing? So I went to uh, physical therapy was the first thing they, you know, they prescribed to me, I guess you'd say. And I, I asked the guy who I'm still friends with, Dr. Brian, I call him. I said, how, how often can I come here? How, how many times can I come to get this fixed as quickly as possible? And he still laughs when we talk about it, but he said, it's going to take longer than you probably want. And they helped me out a lot. It just ended up that I needed surgery to really fix this injury. And um, yeah, so it, it was, I guess I had good days and bad as I was battling through this. And then, but as soon as I got the information of what the problem was, that was a big help for me because now I know how I can overcome it. And it's like the unknown was the worst part of everything it was just not knowing what was wrong and feeling the pain. And then as soon as I started to get some answers and putting myself out there to, to find the answers, then I started to feel a little more optimistic that we could get this fixed. Mm. I think one of the things that's helpful when you have a problem that can be identified is that then you can take action toward that thing and be fairly certain that you're moving in the right direction. 
Whereas when things are uncertain and unanswered, it's just really hard to move at all because you just don't know which way is the right way. Uh, so I think that's a really good point to bring up. And then the other thing too, is this coincided with the divorce for you, right? Yeah, there was, yeah. I mean, the, my Achilles was still torn whenever the, yeah, the divorce started going through. So it was like, I mean, it was like fighting Tyson and he just hits you with a one, two combo to the face. So it was, yeah. I mean, I went through a tough, a tough, probably three to six month period of time. And I'm very open. Uh, I'm starting to become more open about this because I do a lot of keynote speeches and um, I want to be louder about seeking help when this happened. And I don't even mean just physically, mentally as well. So I, I saw some coaches and therapists and just people to help me through this because I knew this was a difficult time for me. I had not been through anything like this before and having two sort of traumatic events, if you want to call them big life events, at least for me being a, an endurance athlete, I needed help to get through it. And I can tell you it was the best thing I ever did. And I, I was just talking to somebody about this last week, seeking help and not being afraid to say I need help was a big deal for me because I fought alcoholism by myself and people are I think originally are inspired by that and that's okay. But I almost wish that I would have got help because I think I would have overcome it quicker than I did had I done it all by myself. So um, yeah, I'm a fan of reaching out if you need help in any area of life. And I'm learning that at 38, it took me 38 years to figure that out, but I'm a slow learner, Joe. What can you say, man? <laughs> hey, you're learning. We all are. We all are. And I, it's, you know, even in 2022, as much as the conversation around mental health specifically has opened up, uh, especially as it pertains to men, there's still a stigma associated with getting help. And I'm glad to see it moving in the right direction, but it's crazy to me because, you know, you're, you, you have a cavity, you go to the dentist, um, you, you tear your Achilles, you go to a surgeon and a physical therapist, you get help for your problems. But there's this stigma around the mental side of things. So I guess a question for you is, what is your take on all of that? And what helped you overcome uh, maybe any resistance you were facing when it came to getting help? Why did you finally reach out? Oh, that's such a good question. And I, I think about this a lot. And I think um, part of it was probably overcoming the alcoholism by myself. So that made me think, I can do anything by myself. And maybe to some extent that can be helpful if if there is a setback that you need to overcome yourself, then I have the confidence to do it. But I really think it was the reason I, I did not want to ask for help originally was I think I wrongfully so, I want to preface, I associated asking for help with weakness and now having lived through it, that couldn't be further from the truth. I think it was closed mindedness. I think it was my ego made me think, well, who am I going to go see somebody? Like I can figure this out. I'm a smart guy. Like I've been through some tough times. I can do it myself. And I think a combination of ego, like you said, the stigma of a man asking for help, especially mentally was something that I was embarrassed by. And, and even like somebody that I had known a friend of mine years ago that said, he's seeing a therapist in my brain, I was thinking, oh, is he like, is he crazy? Is he weak? Like, why does he need to see a therapist? So I was wrongfully associating these, these ideas and getting help with weakness, which is now looking back at it was wrong. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that I think the reason I eventually reached out was um, just the people in my close circle told me that they had gotten help before. Uh, I started talking to people that had gone through divorce. I'm somebody that when when I'm going through something or I'm signing up for an ultra marathon, I want to talk to somebody that has done it before and just say, give me the blueprint. How did you figure it out? So that way I can learn. I'll read a book about it or five books about it. So mm -hmm. as soon as this divorce started going through, 
I was like, okay, let me reach out to somebody who's thriving after they got divorced. Like those are the people I want to talk to. And, you know, when the marriage, when we were trying to work that out, I was trying to associate myself with people that had gone through tough parts of their marriage, but it worked out because that's what I was rooting for at the time. So I love seeing people that have done whatever I'm trying to accomplish and just reaching out and saying, hey, how'd you do it? Can you help me out? Are you willing to give me some advice? And um, and yeah, it, it really helped, especially with the coaches and trainers and therapists. And like, it's almost like I have this all-star team around me that is going to keep me lifted up when I'm going through difficult times. So it's not just me fighting all these things by myself. Mm. You know, the concept was brought up to me, I want to say two years ago about a personal board of advisors, which I promise this ties back in, but you think about a big business and they've got a lot of moving pieces. They want to move in a specific direction. They have a board of advisors, people who are going to help keep them on track. And the concept of a personal board of advisors is, hey, you get your friend who's your biggest cheerleader. You get your friend who uh, will tell you how it is, you know, tell you the truth. You get your friend who's an expert maybe in the area that you want to move and a few others. And you can go to that quote unquote board of advisors and lean on them to help you move in the direction that you want to go. And it sounds like what you did is you crafted that, that board of advisors, if you will, that circle, that team that's going to keep you lifted up, moving in the right direction. And I just think that's so important and it's cliche to an extent because you hear it all the time, but you do become like the people you spend time with. And it's just uh, in the world of social media, it's so easy to associate yourself with things and people and ideas and content that are going to pull you away from the person you want to be. And at the same time, it's very, very possible to surround yourself intentionally with people who are going to lift you up. And I'm curious what your relationship with social media looks like in terms of that. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I, I'm a fan of social media. I definitely enjoy myself on there. And just to bring it back. Like I love that, that idea of the board of advisors. And I, I think this is similar to that. And I swear I'll answer your question on social media. Cause I, I love talking about this. I, I, this was not my idea. I don't know where I got this from, but it's this idea of whenever you have a big decision to make, or let's say you're just having a tough day and you're trying to plow through it. I had a mentor of mine and I think it might've been Jesse Itzler, but I'm not hundred percent sure say to come up with this idea of like a uh, similar to a board of advisors, or maybe it's a dinner table of people. They could be alive, dead. Maybe you met them, maybe you didn't. And it's people you admire or look up to and you run whatever the idea is by them. So for me, like my parents are on there. Jesus is on there. Tony Robbins is on there. David Goggins is on there. And I try to run some of these ideas through okay, what would, what's my dad going to do in this scenario? Cause I admire him. What would Tony Robbins do in this scenario? So I love that idea. And I think it overlaps with the board of advisors having this basically idols, mentors, whatever you want to call them, have a list and act like they're sitting around a dinner table discussing whatever you're trying to figure out. And it, that's really helped me, especially in endurance races, running the different ideas by them. Uh, I wanted to throw that out there and now we'll get to the the social media. I, I think I think my relationship with social media, I'd like to say is healthy because I don't just I just put up a video about this a couple of weeks ago regarding negativity and and haters. And I normally sometimes I'll get it in the comments when I put up a, a picture or video, but normally it comes in my direct messages, maybe because the person doesn't want to see publicly what they're saying. But I, I've always been someone that if I'm not hurting other people or myself and I'm out to add value to others, and normally it's in the form of either hopefully it's good knowledge or entertainment or a mixture of both inspiration, then I'm going to feel good about whatever I'm putting out there. I'm more of a, I'm a Gary Vaynerchuk fan. I don't know if you know who the Gary oh, V. Yeah. Course, so he's a big social media guy. And I love how he says something to the effect of more creating and maybe less consuming. So mm -hmm. I'm more of a creator on there and I want to make sure 
it is social, right? So when people comment on my posts, good or bad, or they send me a direct message, I love to be social. I love to respond because they took the time, even if it's a negative comment, if they watched a, a 50 second video of mine, then left a negative comment, they still watched the whole video and then they decided to leave a negative comment. So they're still consuming the content. It's just a bad comment that they're they're replying with. So I, I do like to be social. I think especially during COVID when we couldn't really go out and be social, at least as much as I wanted to be, it kept me connected with my audience and engaged with them. I was doing um, free workouts. I think we were doing it every single day, Monday through Friday for half an hour during the beginning of COVID, like March, April, May, June of 2020. And I think it just helped me stay connected, stay positive, stay happy when I could not really see these people face to face due to the pandemic. So I'm a big fan. I'm mainly on Instagram. Um, I use Facebook here and there. I, I know nothing about Twitter, so I can't even begin to speak to that. <laughs> but I, I I think if used if you're using social media versus social media using you and fully consuming you, I think it can be a, a big, big positive. And like like us, like us connecting. We connected mm -hmm. on social media, like the people I've had on my podcast. We normally DM each other first. So I think there's a lot of good things about it. I just think the relationship needs to be healthy and it can clearly over consume us if we're not careful, myself included. Yeah. Let me rewind real quick just to say that Goggins, Robbins, Jesus, and your parents, what a dinner table. I mean, <laughs> I don't know your parents. I can imagine they are extremely special people, but like, that's a pretty good dinner table. Um, just wanted that to go one. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I'll say on social media is I completely agree with everything you said. And for me personally, I would consider myself someone who has a small physical circle. The people I see on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, it's very small and that's intentional. I also feel like I have hundreds, if not thousands of friends, actual genuine friends who I could pick up the phone. We haven't talked in a year and we can just pick it right back up through social media, through the past five, six years of building that circle or, or galaxy, if you will, intentionally. And that's a, it's a beautiful part of social media. Um, and so well I agree with that. I I'm the same way. Like I, I don't have many people that I see physically on a, on a weekly or monthly basis, but like you just said, I, I connected with a woman who lives in California and we did a Instagram video and it was just like, we're good friends now. And it felt like there was a genuine connection, even though she's on the other side of the country. So yeah, I, I agree with that. I think there's, it's kind of cool to have that social feel about it. Even if you can't, cannot be with the person face to face. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to ask you the second question, Matt, which is similar to the first, but this one is about the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose. So what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why have you done that thing? Oh man, you're getting some good ones, Joe. I like this. The hardest thing I've ever done on purpose. Um, that's a really good question. I would say, so I did, there, there's a couple that stick out. Um, okay. The one that sticks out right now is probably the Ironman that I did one Ironman last October and uh, then I'll give you the reason why. So I signed up for this Ironman a year before that. So I signed up for what in like October of 2020, because that's how long it takes to, to get ready for this. So for those that do not know, a full Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim. And then you get out of the water. This was in the state of Indiana, Muncie, Indiana, get out of the water and you hop on your bike and you bike 112 miles you get down on the bike, hop off the bike, put on your running shoes, and then you have to run a full marathon. So those three disciplines equate to a full Ironman. And first time I heard about an Ironman, I thought that that's not even humanly possible to do something like that. And like we said, then you start meeting people, women and men that have done Ironmans, and it becomes real. So the reason that this was the hardest thing was 
a lot of what we've touched on. I, this was about a month out from Achilles surgery. So I wasn't sure how it was going to hold up and I was not great in the water. So I'll tell you a quick story just because when I give speeches, I bring this up and most people find it pretty entertaining. The first triathlon I ever did, this is in Pittsburgh and I think it was 2017. First time I ever wore a wetsuit in public. So it, I was already nervous because I the Pittsburgh Rivers, and I know we talked about Philly versus Pittsburgh, but I'll give you one here. The Pittsburgh Rivers are not attractive looking. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're a little brown, they're a little dark, but the the triathlon starts in, in the river. So you jump in. Two minutes before the gun goes off, I have my wetsuit on, I'm getting ready. I'm nervous out of my mind, but I thought, I've been swimming. I'm ready. Let's do it. Guy taps me on the shoulder who I don't know and says, Hey man, I just want to let you know your wetsuit is on backwards. And I was <laughs> like, okay, that's funny. Ha ha. Let's get in the water. Let's go. And he's like, no, no, like I'm serious. Look at everybody else's. So if you've ever, I don't know if you ever put a wetsuit on Joe, but yep. the zipper, I had the zipper in the front because every jacket I ever put on the zipper went up in the front. Why would I flip it around backwards? <laughs> and then I started looking around. This guy was right. The zipper's supposed to go in the back. That's why there's a long string on the end so you can pull it up yourself. In front of the whole, all the athletes and everybody watching, I had to take off my wetsuit, flip it around, and put it back on. I was humiliated out of my mind, and the gun hadn't even gone off yet. So I, I was a train wreck during that swim. I don't know how I made it through it, but I survived. But anyways, fast forward a few years to the Ironman, and that that was in my head. Like this disaster of a swim that happened a couple of years prior was I had to get that thought out of my head and like overcome it with something positive. So mm. I was very lucky that I trained in open water a lot for the Ironman, and that that changed my whole perspective. I trained with a wetsuit on the correct way, and that helped my confidence. So I think the hardest thing I ever had to do which i wanted to do was the iron man and it was because of the achilles tear um obviously some some mental uh hurdles that i was overcoming and it was three different disciplines it's not just running um it's swimming biking and running and mother nature was also not good to us and th this was another takeaway that i learned I had never biked in the rain before and of course during this iron man it would rain almost the entire bike ride. So it's 112 miles in it in probably would it take maybe five, six hours. And it was a downpour for like three and a half hours. So I didn't have the confidence in the rain that I probably should have taken my bike out at some point during the training in the rain, just so I could build that confidence. But, uh, I got through it. So I was the Achilles held up really well during the run was where I was most nervous because that's how I injured it. And uh, it, it just goes back to who you surround yourself with. I have a doctor who's now become a friend of mine, Dr. Onishi, if he's watching this or if he watches the replay, I love you, buddy. The guy literally saved my life by doing this surgery on my Achilles and um, it all worked out. So it, the pain was significant, but, but I shouldn't say pain, the discomfort of the Ironman. It was not injury pain. It was just soreness and pain you're going to feel when you put your body through that. But when I came to the finish line, it was, I mean, I, I cried like when the, when the MC gets on the microphone, he did this for every athlete and you cross the finish line and he goes, Matt Scaletti, you are an Iron Man. And I boom. And I'm like bawling my eyes out as I'm crossing the finish line. So that was probably the hardest thing that I've sort of voluntarily put myself through. Oh man. First of all, that wetsuit story is hilarious. Did you true did, story? Were you wearing anything under the wetsuit? You know what? That's funny you asked that because I, I I gave this speech virtually. This was just like two weeks ago, and somebody raised their hand after, and that that's the question. I hadn't got that question before. I think I must have because I don't think I would have taken it off if I was naked underneath. But I'm sure it was something that was tight and small because i i mean i remember being embarrassed out of my mind i had three friends thank god they were there like surrounding me tight so nobody could see even though everybody knew what i was doing uh it, it was honestly top five 
probably top three most embarrassing things, especially in a fitness event that has ever happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story though. Uh, I guess to kind of wrap up the Iron Man story, why did you do the Iron Man? And we can even extrapolate and just say, why do you do any of the endurance events that you do? That's a really good question. I got, I got to tell you, I got to just give you a shout out, Joe. These questions are really getting me thinking and I, I love it, man. I love going deep and I, I hope I'm adding value to your listeners and viewers because these questions are really, really good. Um, Thank you. Why, why do I do any of this? I, I really think it, a lot of it comes back to the person I was from 2002 to 2011, where I, I, I was basically an alcoholic that added no value to myself or others and sort of a selfish human being during that segment of time. I, I really don't even relate it to myself because I feel like it was a different human being at that time. Um, and I think after overcoming that, it was like, okay, I'm still alive. I can't believe that happened. There's a reason I'm alive. And let's just see how far we can take this thing. And it all started with, I used to compete in physique events, which I did not wear a Speedo. I wore board shorts. Let me just <laughs> clarify. But uh, I think it started with that and it, it just it lit this fire that I continuously think, how far can I go? And I really I don't think I, I hope I'm right about this, but I think I'm in inning two of nine and, and like who knows where where things can go from here. So for me, every time the gun goes off at the beginning of an event, it's just I'm grateful that I was able to make it to the start line of whatever the event is. And then I think what can I do from here? Like, how can I perform in this event to the best of my abilities? And then once the event's over and hopefully it goes well and there's, I'm celebrating and, you know, chatting people up on social media and at these events, it's always, I, I love, I love this motto. And I don't know if I made this up or it's somebody else's, but I consider myself a very happy person. And I, I live by this happy, but never satisfied mentality where I'm going to be silly. I'm going to have fun on social media. I have these 5 a.m. dance parties because that's what I do in the morning is I will start dancing the second my alarm goes off and I change the song. So it's a song that I like to hear when I get up in the morning. But it's the never satisfied piece, too, where once the event is done, OK, we ran 40 miles. OK, let's sign up for a 50 miler because. I did okay in the 40 miler. Then you finish the 50. Is there a hundred K, which is 62 miles. And then I want to keep, as soon as you get to the top of one mountain, I want to look for the next mountain. And I guess that's just a part of the sick obsession. That is my brain and, and my mentality. But I do think it also goes back to, it's like this. Um, I'm trying, I, I'm not running away from who I was. I feel like I'm running towards who I want to be. But at the same time, it's almost like I feel like I have some making up to do for that decade of my life where there's just nothing to be proud of for that period of time. And uh, I'm much pr more proud of the last 10 years than I was when I was in my my late teens and all of my 20s, basically. Mm. So speaking of that time period, you know, so I'm running the New York City Marathon this year. And, um, nice. No, it's, I'm, excited. I'm excited. I've never done that one. I heard that is awesome event. Five boroughs. You're going to crush it, man. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I, uh, I, and I'm raising money for a uh, partnership to end addiction, which is an organization that helps families specifically who are supporting uh, a loved one who's struggling with addiction. And so I guess my question is, you know, when you were going through that time period, because I'd imagine people are dealing with temptations in their own life. If you want to boil it down to temptation, yeah. what were some of the limiting beliefs or the thoughts that went through your head where you justified what you were doing? Because I'm sure that happened, right? You had to have those thoughts like, Hey, this isn't good. I should stop. And then another thought popped in and you said, well, it's okay if I do it just one more time. Right. What were some of those things that went through your head? Oh, that is a good one too. Yeah. Limiting beliefs. I mean, basically my life for 10 years was a limiting belief. So it, 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 I mean, it really was. So what was going through my head was 
in the beginning, when when I was in college, the excuse was I'm a college student. This is what college students do. And I'll even take it a step further, which is somewhat embarrassing to admit this, but it's just my mentality at the time. I had friends that did not drink. And I thought at the time, like, who are these chumps? Like they're in college and they're not drinking. Like that doesn't make any sense. This is when you're supposed to drink. When in reality, I wish I had associated with those guys more often because I probably would have been on a better path. But I think in in my late teens, early 20s, it was this is what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm a, I'm a college student. I'm supposed to drink and get drunk and be silly and have fun. And then when I got out of college, I worked for a student travel company. So it wasn't really much of a step out of college life. I was still working with college kids for two years up in Boston. So that was the excuse at that point. Then I moved back to Pittsburgh and I, I just... I think it was um, my limiting belief became this is just who I am. I am somebody that is a partier and who drinks and who is fun when he drinks. So I, I basically had proven to myself over time, this is a part of my identity. I had done it so often. It was who I was. And, and there were really times, and I have journal entries of this, which I wish I would have kept more of these, but... There were times where I actually thought there was no way for the rest of my life I could stop drinking. Like it, it felt like it was an impossible thing to do. And it's crazy to think that, that I really thought I could not get out of this. Um, and it was just who I was going to have to be. So it, it was, thank God it was, um, nobody got physically injured. I didn't do anything ridiculously terrible to anybody. Uh, I, I just learned through embarrassment really uh, I went to a church function drunk. That was one of the, that was probably the, one of the lowest points of my life. And I'm, I'm sad that it happened because I embarrassed some people, but I'm also grateful it happened because it, it helped trigger the change. And it was one of those mornings where I woke up on the floor of my living room and it was like 6 a.m. I'm obviously hung over Sunday morning and I looked in the mirror and for whatever reason, thank God, it had to be God or something in the heavens that helped me with this. It was just, I looked at myself and I, the person looking back, it was, it felt so pathetic and like, like there was no soul, there was no drive, there was no fire inside of me. And it was just the turning point. It was, and, and it was one of these, we're talking about limiting beliefs. I thought about, okay, I think I was 28 at the time. I thought, okay, what if I keep doing this when I'm 38, when I'm 48, when I'm 58, like I'm going to ruin every friendship that I have because I was a jerk when I was drunk a lot of the time. I'm probably going to be dead or do something really stupid, end up in jail. This has to stop now because the progression is so bad that I'm going to do something bad to somebody I love myself or a random stranger. And it, it was just that moment where it had to change. And I think that the pain of staying the same for the first time was worse than the pain of changing. And then it really, it was, it, it wasn't a change overnight. Like it took months for me to, to make this change, but it was so empowering to wake up and be like, okay, I can make it through one day or, or even like one hour. Like, let me get through one hour. Okay. Let me get through another hour. I had to tell some of my friends, I, I would make up stories why I could not hang out with them in the beginning because I wasn't strong enough to say I can't be around alcohol. So it was definitely a process. But um, yeah, I, I think that was uh, that I'm so blessed that that all happened. And I don't I do not regret it because I think everything happens for a reason, like we talked about. And I have no clue what your original question was, but I hope that answered it. <laughs> that was perfect, man. That was perfect. I forgot the question too, but that was perfect. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you this. So, so you, you came out of that season of life and you're now running toward the person who you can become. It's, it's potential, if you will. Who can Matt be? And you're running that way. That requires endurance. Uh, obviously, you're into the world of endurance sport, but that journey, just that personal development and journey, journey requires endurance. To you, what does the word endurance mean? Ooh, so endurance, and, and I think you're right. Endurance is, 
it's just, there's so many areas of life where, I mean, that is life, right? Like life is endurance. It's one big endurance race, if you will. And so I think endurance to me is a bunch of things. I think it's uncertainty because, I mean, I just related to the first hundred mile ultra marathon I did where you're uncertain. You don't know how you're going to feel. You've never been in the situation before the word endurance in life. How many times do every morning we wake up, we have no idea how the day is going to end. Anything could happen that day. So I think endurance is, is overcoming setbacks and getting stronger along the way and in really just dealing with uncertainty consistently but enjoying the ride as well. So I think this idea of, and we briefly talked about it before we started recording, like endurance, you're going to suffer in an endurance race. Like it's, it's going to happen. You're going to go through discomfort, pain, whatever the word is. But once you overcome that, what's on the other side is like this euphoric feeling that is almost impossible to explain. If, if, you know, if you haven't done one of these events, it's just, it's the most incredible feeling. So I think endurance is like a mishmash of longevity. And in that longevity is setbacks and suffering and pain and discomfort. But if you can endure on the other side is this feeling unlike any other that is, it's addicting. It's an addicting feeling to get through all of the crap storm. And then once you endure, the other side is pretty glorious. Mm. I agree completely. And I'm going to share another quote with you that I've shared on the podcast before. So if you're listening and you've heard this before, I, I apologize, but I'm really not sorry because it's that good. So Matt, I'm not sure if you've heard this before, but imagine that when your life starts, you're just this big block of marble, this big rectangular block of marble. Alexis Carroll once said, man cannot remake himself without suffering for he is both the marble and the sculptor. And it's just this beautiful image, right? Like you are chiseling away at yourself and that's painful. That is suffering that requires endurance. But at the end, you get to reveal what's on the inside and that's your, your full potential. That you are dropping bombs on this episode, my friend. That's a good one. I, that's a, that's a really good one. I agree. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I, I can just speak to it because the 10 years where I was an alcoholic, there there was no there was no suffering. I mean, I was trying to live every day like it was a party and it led me down a horrible path. So this idea of put, I, I love this concept and I think it's similar to that quote of voluntary discomfort. So it's something as simple as and and I I put this on social media quite a bit, taking the stairs. So I, I work on a, on a 10th floor and I will refuse to take the elevator up just because does it suck to walk up 10 flights of stairs, especially when it's 90 degrees out and the stairwell is hot? Yes, it sucks, but it's like, it's like a mini endurance thing. And then when you get to the top, it's like, okay, if I have to deal with a tough meeting today, well, I already overcame those 10 flights of stairs that most people did not do. I'm ready for the phone call, the meeting. Uh, that difficult discussion I have to have. So, yeah, I love that idea of the marble and, and chiseling, chiseling away. And there is going to be suffering, but we get it. And I love that. I love that even more because you get to sculpt whatever you want, right? Like it's your life to live it however you'd like. And that's just a really good quote. I need to write that down in my journal, my friend. You yeah. really got me thinking. You could thank Alexis Carroll for that one. Alexis um, Carroll, that's who it is. I got to write that down. Yeah. So, as we begin to wind things down here, Matt, this last question is a special one to me because at various points in my life, I've needed people to speak words of encouragement into me. And words can have such a powerful impact on people. And I imagine that there are people listening to this podcast, wherever they are, going through some stuff because everybody's fighting their own battles. And so if you were to speak directly to somebody who's going through just a tough season of life, Maybe it's something they chose. Maybe it's something that chose them, but it's just really, really hard. And they're not sure what to do next or where to turn. What would you say to that person? Wow. That's a really good question too. Uh, I've never thought about that, that exactly that way before. I would say 
somebody going through sort of a winter. I love how you say the seasons because I, I agree with that. There's seasons of life going through, let's say a winter of your life is um, first off. I mean, just because I've done it recently is ask for help. If you need it, don't be uh, don't be like me for many years and think you're above asking for help. Because I think, I think there are so many genuine people in the world that really are out to help other people. And if you find one or two of those, I think they can they can breathe new life into you or help you get over whatever whatever the the um the setback is that you're trying to overcome. And I think the other thing is and I learned this from a mentor of mine during uh right before my first ultra marathon and he said I'm just kind of laughing cuz it's so simple but it's just so true. He said two things. First off is one step at a time, that's all it takes and he said if you take one step at a time, one after the other, how far are you going to go? And it's whatever the distance of the event is that you're eventually going to get there. And the second thing is constant forward motion. So if you're doing those two things, no matter if the event is a 5K or a 50K, you're eventually going to get there. So I would say whatever, if you're going through something right now, you can just break it down to the smallest of steps and start there because my brain sometimes goes to a way too big of a picture and I get overwhelmed. And let's just say I used to do a, do a lot of personal training years ago and it was, okay, somebody wants to lose 50 pounds. Okay, that, that's great. What if we focus on losing two pounds a week? In just the first week, let's lose one or two pounds. Okay, you did it. Not Don't think there's 48 left to go. Let's just think, okay, how are you going to lose one to two next week and sort of chunk it down into these smaller pieces? And it's what, what, what's the quote? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Like, it's just that's how I think you attack many things in life is break it down to its smallest pieces and take the first take the first step. I had I had a, a woman on my podcast who's a triathlete for the USA triathlon team and i think she's in her age group is like 68 years old she could not walk to the mailbox a couple years prior i think she was 65 couldn't walk to the mailbox at age 67 she's competing for the usa triathlon team and it's like well how did she do that one step at a time she walked to the mailbox then she slowly jogged to the mailbox then she jogged to the next mailbox and it just built on top of each other so Whatever setback, whatever you're going through, I would say, first off, seek help. If you think you need it, seek guidance from somebody that has been in your shoes and has gotten through it. And then just keep taking one small step at a time. And then uh, beautiful things can happen. I mean, little one hour chunks at a time. Uh, and with my sobriety, it was like one day at a time. It's not I'm going to be sober for the next 10 years. It's I'm going to be sober for today mm -hmm. and we're going to get through today and then we'll worry about tomorrow when it comes. And little by little, little becomes a lot. Um, it's so it's true, isn't it? Oh, by the way, sad. I'm throwing this out there not to change the subject, but I'm officially saying this just so your listeners and viewers know this. I'm going to have Joe on my podcast ASAP because this is way too good. I need to flip around these questions and find out what your answers are going to be. So you're coming on. I'm forcing you to do it. Uh, we're making it happen. It would be an honor, Matt. You've got it, man. Um, you know, and with that being said, I want people to be able to find good people through this podcast. And you're obviously one of them. Obviously, you're on social media, Instagram predominantly, and then a little bit Facebook. People wanted to connect with you or follow along with what you have going on. What's what's the Instagram handle? Where's the best place for them to find you? As long as you're okay with a little bit of craziness, uh, feel free to to follow along. So it's just my name. It's at Matt Scaletti. And I'm sure you'll have it in the in the show notes. S-C-O-L-E-T-T-I. Yep. I will say um, I respond to every direct message. Sometimes it takes me a couple of days, but I, I that's just one of the things with social media, too. If somebody's going to take the time to look me up, click on the little message thing and then type out a well-written question or comment, I, I just believe I should take the time to respond to that person. So feel free to reach out to me, follow me, DM me, whatever. And um, hopefully we can get a good discussion going. So nothing's off limits on DM either. You want to ask me any questions about fitness, healthy living, happy to answer or direct it to somebody that 
knows a lot more than me. Mm. <laughs> if if you're listening to this podcast and you feel like something Matt or I said in this episode resonated and you're on the fence about reaching out, I can speak for myself and Matt just spoke for himself. Reach out to either one of us or both of us because we would love to help. And uh, Matt, I'm just so grateful for you, uh, your vulnerability, your story, everything that you're doing. And uh, I cannot wait to have a conversation on your podcast. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you right back, my friend. I'm so excited that we're Pennsylvania's representing, even though, and I need to say it on the show that Joe lives on the wrong side of the state. We need to get him out to the Western PA, but that's the story for another day. Hey, I appreciate you, my friend. You, really, I mean this, your questions, uh, just incredible. The homework you did and the questions you ask are really got me thinking and I hope it helped out your audience. I know it did and I appreciate that so much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.